Welcome back, apes, to officially the most wonderful time of the year. It is earning season once again. I know some of you might think maybe Christmas is coming early. Nope, unfortunately not. It's even better than that, however, because we all know that the real most wonderful time of the year is, of course, earning season. When companies, you know, they take off their shirts, they let us see exactly what's going on underneath, and we can check it out and make fun of them, uh, tell them how jacked they are, whatever else it might be. We are kickstarting that with the Death Star itself, JP Morgan Chase & Co. They are kickstarting this earning season like they do for pretty much every other earnings season along with a couple other large banks that reported today and over the next couple of days stay tuned because we're going to be covering all of that action and letting you know exactly how much crack the market is smoking in terms of its responses to the numbers you would have thought jamie diamond got shot in the head or something the way that analysts were trading this earnings report and going over the reaction to it here shares are down about six percent and it's only 3 47 p.m so maybe they'll have a, a spike in the last 13 minutes of the day here but most likely not let's go ahead and break down some of the numbers apes Welcome back to the five minute peel. We might actually be able to contain this one within five minutes because we're going to do things a little bit differently here today. Instead of assessing JP Morgan in its entirety and letting you know how it is as an overall investment opportunity, we are just going to be focusing on its first quarter 2024 earnings report. We're going to be assessing the numbers, the market's reaction, and figuring out how schizophrenic this reaction exactly is. So let's go ahead and get started with it. You guys know how this goes already. I'm going to pull up my trusty Word document and we are going to dive right in. So, what we're talking about here really is betting on America. Anytime you're considering an investment in JP Morgan, that is effectively what you're doing. So first and foremost, we want to talk about the numbers that they reported and how this compares to analyst expectations. First thing to notice is that EPS knocked it out of the park, beating by 8.03%, hitting $4.44 versus the $4.11 per share that was expected. Revenue beat by a decent margin as well. Estimates were for $41.85 billion. We got 43.55 billion, so beating by about 4.06%. It was pretty healthy growth as well. If we scroll down, we're basically comparing all of these figures against the first quarter of last year. We want to break down that revenue figure quite a lot because that's really the important metric that's going on here. And we'll explain exactly why in just a quick second. So like we said, 43.55 billion, that's about 13.56% growth compared to one year ago. So very strong point of growth for JP Morgan, you know, especially in 2023, uh, or compared to 2023, because we were coming off a bit of a lower low last year. So there were concerns that growth was going to slow dramatically. That is not what we saw. Pretty good sign in that regard. Big reason for it was because of strong growth in net interest revenues. They grew 11.45%, which was a little bit less than the market was expecting, to be quite honest with you, but still very healthy growth. And if we break down JP Morgan's segments a little bit here, we can see that the corporate and investment bank was really the one that was weighing on that overall revenue growth. This is exactly why you didn't get that offer. Don't blame it on your own shitty resume or anything. It's because corporate and investment bank revenue grew so slowly, only doing 16 uh excuse me 13.63 billion versus 13.6 billion at, at the same time last year now we did see an explosion in growth in terms of the corporate segment now corporate because of jp morgan is such a big business it's basically its own customer at the same time so this is really revenue that's earned on investments and other things in treasury in the cio's office that absolutely exploded it's entirely due to rate hikes and basically jp morgan's big strategy here has been we are going to take advantage of the extremely high rates in short-term treasuries but we're certainly not going to pay our depositors uh, a requisite amount that kind of correlates with how much they're making and that's basically what we're seeing right there the explosion in that revenue growth now obviously that doesn't come out until the cost side of things but when we break it down a little bit we see the net income grew at a somewhat healthy rate at the same time 6.31 percent now the big concern here is that it grew much less than overall revenue did and that's not a great sign in terms of operating leverage because it means that although revenue growth was accelerating net uh, they didn't do a great job on cost cutting essentially now Obviously, net income still grew. Can't really knock them for that. It's honestly kind of a non-factor here in this report. It's not really something we should be exactly too concerned about. Going back to that EPS figure, however, we can see that this grew about 8.29% annually compared to the first quarter. Once again, relatively strong growth. But when we extract the special assessment fee that the FDIC charged JP Morgan and a couple other banks due to the failures of banks like SVB and others last year, we see that they had to pay about $725 million. So adjusting for that, they would have had an earnings per share of $4.63, 12.93% growth, very solid in that regard. So that gets us back uh, actually much closer to the growth in overall revenue. So that's why it's really not that much of a concern. Now, one of the things that did kind of concern us a little bit, however, was loan loss provisions. Now, normally seeing a decline in loan loss provisions, it's a pretty good thing because it shows that the bank is more confident about its ability to absorb losses and keep in stride during economic hardships. 
That is not what Jamie Dimon said on the call, however. What Jamie said was he, he was directly asked what the bank thought about the commercial real estate market, basically said that nothing was changed compared to last year. If that's the case, why is it down 28% quarter over quarter and almost 8% year over year? If everything's the same, you would think that you'd want to keep that the same or increase it otherwise. But nope, they went ahead and cut loan loss provisions, still have loss absorbing power of about $520 billion. So we can't really be too mad. Obviously, the stock's done pretty well over the past year or so. So, you know, they're in a relatively good position. So let's talk about the market's reaction here. This is essentially what's going on. Shares were down, like I said, almost 6%. Would have thought Jamie Dimon got shot in the head. The big concern was net interest income guidance. So if we go back up here, we can see that the company's net interest revenue was about $23 billion for the quarter. Annualized, that gets us to about $86 billion or so. Uh, but that's not what the company was guiding for anyway. Basically, JP Morgan came out and said that they expect only, air quotes, only $90 billion in 2024 net interest income. Uh, and that is barely any growth compared to 2023 and certainly negative growth when we factor in inflationary pressures, only 0.67% growth. So obviously not what analysts want to see. But if you ask me, this is insanely conservative guidance from JP Morgan. And one of the big reasons is that is because in our view, in my own personal view, I think that JP Morgan is way overestimating the impact on of rate cuts. They're probably expecting bond yields to fall, and by proxy of bond yields falling, the total interest that they'll receive on the short-term investments is going to fall as well. Personally, I don't think the Fed's going to do more than two cuts this year, so I think that's way too conservative already. Uh, clearly, the market disagrees. They're going with that guidance. And that's kind of the big reason here, or that's one of the big themes of this report driving our opinion that you guys will see in just a quick second. Now, the balance sheet is still healthier than fucking Dr. Andrew Huberman or whatever that guy's name is. Like I said, $520 billion in loss absorbing power. Really, one of the big things was an ROE of 17% and an ROTC of 21%. Extremely strong growth there, seeing that return on tangible common equity up in the over 20% range is an absolutely fantastic sign. Another great sign was the growth in uh, AUM under the asset and wealth management segment. Now, this did grow about 19% to $3.6 trillion. A good bit of that is going to be due to just the overall rise in equity markets, but still very strong sign for this company. The other big thing we wanted to mention here was that if you go through the report, they report things as XFR, aka X First Republic, and pretty much across the board, every XFR line item was worse. Or, you know, if you a lot of this growth that we saw is from the First Republic acquisition. And then even on a per share basis, we can see that it was more accretive when we factor in First Republic. So very good acquisition. Uh, strong performance that management team has been able to incorporate into the bank on a very profitable basis. So very good sign uh, pretty much all across the board. Really, the only thing was that negative guidance. And that's why we kind of think that this is a very strong overreaction to the company's earnings report. I believe this guidance is way too conservative, exactly like I just said, stepping all over my content. Our view for zero to two rate hikes in 2024 means that that is way too ultra conservative for us right now. The big thing about investing in JP Morgan, and you, you got to think about what am I really buying here? You're buying the largest bank in the United States, the most valuable bank in the entire world, the biggest lubricant of the global economy. Basically, what you're doing is betting on America because we know that banks are the economic engines that kind of drive the economy through providing capital to entrepreneurs and companies looking to do projects that they don't otherwise have the funds to do. Basically, what you're doing in buying JP Morgan is betting that the United States is going to have a good economic year because JP Morgan's fundamental performance is going to be linked directly to that because Jesus Christ, if these guys get any bigger, they basically are going to be the US economy. So that's kind of what you're betting on when you invest in JP Morgan. Now, one of the biggest concerns with this company is Mr. Jamie Dimon and his age. He's getting up there in age. I didn't look it up exactly what it was before this video, but if he leaves the bank, I mean, Jesus Christ, the value might go negative. Everybody loves Jamie Dimon more than they love their own children. So it would be a really tough scene to see Dimon ultimately leave the firm. He has shown very little sign of doing so, and I think he actually even re-upped his contract, but that's one of those things that's pretty shaky. That's really the main concern. Other than economic shocks is that Jamie Dimon bails the fuck out of there. We saw, uh, more, what's his name, Moynihan considering leaving. We saw Morgan Stanley's old CEO leave. It's kind of a time for a changing of the guard in terms of Wall Street CEOs. Mm -hmm. JP Morgan investors better hope that Jamie Dimon doesn't get in on that. Plus, it would be pretty interesting to see if they're considering being acquisitive at all, given that they have $1.5 trillion in cash. Now, 
being a bank, they do have certain capital requirements that they have to maintain. So it's not like they can dump that all out onto an acquisition. But buying something like a Schwab, that would be a crazy acquisition because JP Morgan has about a $550 billion market cap. Schwab is around $125 billion. But maybe something more like a Robin Hood, just like we talked about last week, to get in touch with the younger crowd. All right. With all this in mind, guys, what is WSO's rating? I think you guys already have a bit of an indication right here. We're slapping four out of five bananas on this bad boy. That shouldn't say avoid. That should say overweight. Uh, so definitely would want to be overweight this investment if you have it in your portfolio. Not necessarily a screaming buy at this level unless you're a big buy the dipper because if that is kind of your normal philosophy, then this absolutely is a screaming buy because... This thing's going to recover in no time, down 6% because of relatively weak guidance, even though it was ultra conservative. Give me a fucking break. I hope you guys bought shares today uh, if you were thinking about it already, because, you know, if I was going to invest in the banking system and I was going to go outside like a fintech play or a small regional bank to bet on commercial real estate being less shitty than it's ex expected to be, the only bank I'm considering is JP Morgan, because exactly like I said, they dominate the sector. It's basically like betting on the United States. Four out of five bananas for JP Morgan. Guys, let us know if you bought this thing, what exactly your thoughts are going forward, if you already hold it in your portfolio and how much pain you're feeling. Most of all, let us know what other news and companies you want to see us cover next. That's it for this video. Happy investing, happy trading. We'll see you guys soon. Bye now.